All righty, welcome to the Windy Ridge Outdoors podcast. Today we're here with Ben. You can wave your hands, everyone knows who you are. We're here with Aaron and Jeremiah. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about everything, but with hunting season just coming up this past weekend, we were all talking about it, and we thought that a good thing to discuss would be tree stands and the different types of tree stands and why you should use some and why you shouldn't use others. Ben, I'll let you, I'll let you get started with your bread and butter, the old saddle stand. I have a tethered saddle, the Phantom. I love it. I used to have the uh, Wolfang, or the, there's a bunch of other ones, but anyways, I have to have uh, public land equipment because I'm now hunting public land. I used to hunt privates and now I lost all my private land permissions. So, so why is it that the saddle stand helps you with private land over public land? Well, with the saddle, it's a lot lighter, and it's I'm more of a run game. I like to get in the stand as quick as possible, and I can take it all down. Plus, on public land, you guys know you have a lot of other people from out of state. I got guys from Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee coming over hunting the same areas that I'm hunting in. I remember you talking about something. What was you saying about you're not even allowed to put screws or anything into trees? Or I read on the regs before I just started this past year started public land hunting and I read you cannot have any pegs, anything screw on into a tree. So I would say it's more of a thing when if they decide to cut down that tree, so well, do they would grow in the wood. Yeah, I'll, that was actually what I was gonna ask though was, do they do timbering on public land? They, uh, I don't think so. It's probably more of like a conservation thing. They don't want to damage the trees, but more, but, more likely the biologist is that doesn't want to hurt the trees. Yeah, they just replant a lot of these public lands. Is it like reclaimed land was West Baco or reclaim land, and then they re they timbered it a long time ago. And then now they've replanted a bunch of pine trees, and now they don't want to damage all the pine trees that they put in. Yeah, so you know, with a with a tree climber or with a regular old ladder stand, you've got to strap it to the tree, and some of them you got to screw down. But with that, with your tether your tether stand that you're talking about, there's no screws. There ain't well, no screws. It's all straps, rope. That's basically all I have. But nothing screwed down. You know, I have to strap. It's mostly all rope. I was thinking about using a climber to go with him to record some, but he was talking those climbers a lot of times you don't really have a good experience with them because they're not safe. Well, it, and it, I would say it takes a lot of experience too. Because yeah. usually some people with back issues and stuff like that, they can't stand with putting that too much pressure. Yeah. Yeah. In. And I mean, you do have to be in fairly decent shape to use a self climber. And even if you, you do use a self climber, and I'll let Ben talk a little more about this, but you've got to watch what kind of trees you got to use with a self climber because they can slide down the tree, can't they? Yeah. So you got a beech tree, anything slick bark trees, you got to be very careful. Normally, I do try to find a poplar or an oak, maybe even a hickory. A hickory, anything with rough bark, that's what even, even with the tether saddles, that's your most. Yeah, we have a lot of rough bark trees around here. We've got a lot of ash, oaks, yeah. poplars. But with the rougher bark, that's what's going to secure that rope because you're just making a, a noose or choking the tree out with you know your rope. And that's and you're putting all your body weight backwards. You're just basically hanging backwards. You know, normally you're standing straight up and down on a tree. So if you're an older hunter, um, you know, if you're if you're 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, or even if you're younger, but you know you're not as strong, or if you've got health issues, do you think that a ladder stand is still safer? You know, just because I don't know much about the tether stands, but with a, of course with a ladder stand, you know, you'll need help getting it set up and strapped to the tree. Right. You but always, you always need to have if you're going to use a ladder stand, you always need to have two at least two people to help you set it up. Set it up because and also making sure that you're okay going up. Oh, right. Especially, you don't have no safety equipment. I stress this too many times. That's why I went with the saddle, because you're always tied in all times. With a lineman's belt, you're climbing up with a lineman's belt, and as you're setting up the platform, my, my tether predator platform, you're always tied in, and you hook up your tether, and you're always hooked on. So are you suggesting, are you saying that you think that, that the, that the that the saddle stand is actually potentially safer than just a regular ladder stand? To me, 
all it's to me it's a personal preference. Some people like ladder stands. I still got ladder stands. Let's see, that's what I hunted with. But I, just a personal preference. I, I'm I used to be a tree stand hunter. I used to hang stands and leave them there, and then every year I take them down, and then I find new places. Now with the the tethers, uh, it's more mobile. I can go set up any tree, whatever diet. I mean. I, Whenever I'm saying diameter of the tree, I ain't good. Ain't gonna be nothing, you know, really tiny. But these, at least a basketball sized tree, is you climb up in it. Any, it could be dog. I've had dog leg limbs that stick way out, and I hang off of that. Really. So really, one of the only disadvantages to a tether stand is that. At least with the ladder stand, once you get a set, set up, it's there. Right. But but every time you use a saddle, you got to kind of reset up and climb up a tree and do your thing. But I mean, you can you can leave it there if you want to and hunt the next day with it. Well, the ladder stand, if you want to move it, you got to take down the whole the whole thing down. You know the rope or your straps. You got it's normally they come in three different sections. So you gotta take them all down and whatnot. To me, I think it's a hassle. And yeah, I would say it's a hassle too, because if you're, if you're hunting on public land and you're putting a tree stand, for example, and, you got uh, a, and another, another person will come in using it on or, and, or stealing it. You know, right. that's, that's what, at least $400, $500 uh, worth of a uh, stand there being gone or being and used to damage. That's why on public land, I this past year I had four cameras over there where I hunt at. I had all four cameras, they're still there, surprisingly, but I to open it up and SD cards are gone. Cause you got some idiot out there likes to jack around and take other people's stuff. And they know what's in that area oh, too. And they know, exactly. And I haven't even seen what kind of bucks I got on my truck camera. Now I got cell cameras now, Moultrie cell cams, but I still got them 12, 10 to 12 foot up in the air now with a pivot or a, a pivot so I can face it down. So no one can grab So nobody can't steal because I don't got no locking devices on. Well, sp speaking of cell cams, we'll go off on a little bit of a rat trail, just something that I was reading, but I've read in multiple states that they're actually considering full on banning cell cams because they feel like it's not right for the game. They call it unsportsmanlike. What's your thoughts on that? It can be cheating a little bit. To me, it, I don't got the whole lot of time with my work schedule. I mean, you know. <laughs> well, and, and that's what I'm saying. You know, for for us guys that work, you know, 40 to 60 hours a week, it's hard to find that time, especially when you are hunting on public land and you've got your camera set way back up in the hauler. You know, you can't always have find time to go out there and check those cameras. Yeah. Especially where I public land hunt, I, most time I walk into two to three miles just to get to my spots. I just the other just a couple of days ago, I went and pulled a camera, one of my cell cameras, because it didn't have a good enough service. And plus it wasn't a very good prime, good looking area. So I scouted a bunch of other different parts of the public land. And I seen where it was a really good sign and put up the cell camera and then I don't have to worry about it. I can always keep, you know, keep eye on my phone while I'm at work and say, hey, you got a buck, pretty nice buck in this area. And then whenever I got the time, I could at least try to go slip in there and hopefully kill them. Yeah. yeah. This it's more of a monitor, uh, monitoring your cameras, know which, where your deer are going and where, this kind of word is going pretty much. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's the world that we live in. Everything's modernizing. I don't see that as a bad thing. I know that there's people who's been hunting, and you know, there was a time where there weren't cell cameras at all. So I mean, you right. could you could even argue. I'm sure back then that they argued the regular cell cam cameras were right. wrong because you know before cell cams, you didn't know what there was till you went and sat down. Right. But it's the way that the world works. The world's modernizing, and honestly, something we've been talking about: cell cams aren't just good for hunting; they're great for trapping. Good for trapping, even for uh, if you got a poacher. I yeah, know, we got a lot of where I used to private land hunt. We used to use regular trail cameras, and I still got regular trail cameras I use there at the house. And a lot of times I use them for if somebody's po or poaching or somebody's coming on our property, so I know who it is, and I can go knock on their door and say, "Hey, you need to stay out." So I mean, it's a good opportunity to to use them. So. In your opinion, because I, I, I've known you for a long time, what is the reason that you guys decide to use a tree stand, any form of a tree stand over just hunting out of a blind, especially during bow season? For, for me, 
I've always hung out of a tree stand for a long time. And then several years ago, I was having troubles with my sugar. And then I passed out out of a tree stand. I was about at least 30 foot up in the air. Passed out and I did my locking device. Your uh, harness. My harness. Uh, and then lock until I was two foot off the ground. So, and then mother wasn't very happy when I came home all bloody. My face was all scratched. Hit my knee on the pegs. I was all bruised up. So I, I got went to the doctor and got that figured out. And then I couldn't get back to hunting out a tree stand, so I started hunting out of blinds. Well, I've learned really quick. Every time I hunt out of a blind, the deer sees me immediately. Even if I had it bl blended in perfectly, somehow they like they can see you face to face at the deer. Well, the other thing is, you know, I think whenever you're up in a tree and you've got that wind blown, at least if you're above that's, the deer, that's what I was going to. Yeah, the, the 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 wind the wind is going to carry your scent over top of that deer instead of straight on to them. That's what well, I like. if you watch the video that we posted the other day. You can see where I was at. It never saw him in, in where he was at. He just had better coverage. I don't know how the thing spotted me because I just, that was not moving. And the, crazy, and the craziest thing is the deer went tilted up. Well, yeah, and, and, that's, and well, that's why I'm in a tree stand because uh, deers don't normally look up. Well, if they. Well, the thing is about the deers, you know how like horses, they can't see straight. They have like pretty much. Oh, spot. yeah. It's, they're they're yeah. actually seeing like this, basically. They're seeing behind yeah, them. Yeah, that's it. They got 180 from here to there. Yeah. But for that deer, you know, you know, scientists can predict it pretty much pretty good. But when it comes down to that deer, you cannot, they can see kind of uphill, like uphill a little bit while looking straight. So it kind of looked like it tilted up just a little bit to see you. Well, well and the, the, other, the is, other thing about that deer is you've got to think. That deer was on a hillside, yeah, and, that, and, that, and that hillside was was facing with you. Yeah. So yeah. that deer, yeah. if that deer was technically looking straight ahead, it had pretty much a direct shot of sight right to you. Well, another thing with deer too, you gotta you gotta make sure is even if they're not looking at you, you don't want to move. And deer's when they're looking for stuff, they're not necessarily just picking up movement. They're picking up a changing picture. Or something I learned a couple days ago. They're they're actually looking at like. Not like us. They see differently than us. They're like more of a 2D. We see 3D. What and do you guys think about that new, that, that blind where you can see out of all the way around it? I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, I'm sure it'd be nice to have. I, like, I've seen uh, a YouTube video a while back because I, I was about to get one for Ben when I was stationed in Colorado. And this guy, he was just sitting right in the middle and he could see everything. And plus, like, I don't know where he was at. I can't remember. But there was at least three good bucks with at least five does all around them. I feel like that would be more viable in a, in a state like Ohio or in, Iowa or Indiana where there's a lot of fields. Like you're, you're not putting a tree stand a lot of places out there, so you just need a really nice blind. Oh, but the thing is, too, is that it depends on what the camouflage look like. Yeah. Yeah, so you got to make sure it's placed in a certain position. Cause one, because there's some camouflages out there. Like, for example, if I was wearing a, like, like you know how the military is OCP with like different colors stuff. I gotta make sure I'm in the area where it has the same color so I can blend in more. So like the the you know like your off brands or the brands that you know mossy oak and stuff like that. You know you gotta make sure that that color goes in straight into what season and also the the background. Yeah. And I mean, you know, what, hunting in West Virginia is a lot different than hunting in other states. I mean, See, well, you've got trees everywhere down here, so it's yeah. easy to get close to them. They're a lot easier. Once the Midwest, I mean, like Iowa and all them, it's all flat land. Like you talked about in that one video, when you guys went to Ohio, you've seen how flat it is. There's hardly any trees to climb yeah. in. And so, so really, really that's, that's, that's when a really nice pop-up line would be nice. You just... Figure out where you're gonna hunt, pop it up there. But even then, it's still gonna be be hard to get a shot at that deer because they're not funneled into an area. Because like down there where I'm hunting at, it's just it's a small open area, and we've got the deer feeder there. And it's a good it's a good spot even if you didn't have a deer feeder because there's like three different deer paths that are converging into that open spot because it's just a nice open area to feed on and, and stuff like that. Yeah, like another thing too, I would say like in Ohio, if I if I was living in Ohio, I would build me. Put some trees, uh, seeds or like fake like trees and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and build like you know how like we had 
our our dad and grandpa built a tree stand. Yeah, something similar to that, to where it's like in in a like cornfield or just the middle of a grass area. Yeah, and you just plant it to where it's like it's it's up top, but it feels like it's a tree to them. And, and I feel like a lot of that would would have to do, especially if you're in the plains or around here. If you build a permanent structure and those animals are used to seeing that there every day of the year, year and round, be around it. yeah, like and it's not going to bother them. But don't go anywhere. We're going to come right back after this commercial break. We're going to continue to talk about camouflage stands, blinds, and more. Thanks. Would you like to attract animals like Joe Biden's attracted to little kids? Then try Windy Ridge Trapper Lures. We have a large lineup of lures such as Beaver Buster, Bobcat Buster, Mad Dog, and Coon Juice, and many more. You can buy them in our Rockport area where we buy fur, in our retail locations located all around West Virginia, or Murray'sLures.com. Thanks. All right, welcome back from the break, guys. We're going to continue to talk about camouflage and blinds, and we'll just start right off. What do you guys build your blinds out of? I mean, I know that a lot of people will use rough cut, and they'll just do board and bat, and I know that that's the way that Adam did build his, and I, I believe that's the way that you guys built yours, correct? Ours is all rough cut. We have our own sawmill, so we everything's all rough cut. And we put it together, and that's we still have it to this day so do you coat it in oil or have what do you do to preserve the wood because you know rough cut it would just rot well it's not even oiled or nothing and just just regular rough cut so far it's holding <laughs> but it's probably oak and then i know yes, oak is pretty rock proof you see every every blind that i've ever hunted out of has always been painted in oil with diesel diesel fuel mixed in yeah just trying to preserve it yeah and they don't really have much of a problem rotting i i heard that uh, if you use a uh, rat poison that, that helps with uh, really? like in it yeah because uh um in carpentry class my uh teacher told me if you're using um just wood from like the backyard or, like we have a saw and stuff if you use a lot of rat poisoning and it smother the wood and stuff like that it kind of preserve it to make it more of a seasonal thing and it yeah. lasts well that probably also help with like having mice and, yeah, and, and that too. stuff either way i know that a, a very important place to put those types of blinds like aaron was talking about during the commercial break you know you need to know where the deer are at, where they're moving, why they're moving through there. See, where I this there's this one place I've hunted since I was a little kid, and I always either me or my brother or him, my other brother, always kills a really big buck there, or not not a little bit, but like a nice buck you'd be okay with, and so, uh, you'll get a nice buck every other year. But you've got so it's in a valley. You've got a pond right here, the building, the hunting blinds right here. And you've got, it's just the deer are always walking around because there's an opening in the trees here and here. And they're all just running around in there, just moving back and forth or going to get water. Well, it's also a cattle farm. So yeah. so the, the the cattle have already got trails made. Mm -hmm. the, the, the deer don't have to run through real thick brush right through yeah. there. And like you're saying, there's a water source. And you're getting a lot of good shots out of deer. Yeah, it's it's a really, it's it's very rare, especially in this part of uh, the Minnehaha Valley in, in West Virginia, to find an open field as big as that yeah. is there's not there's not a lot of that around well either. yeah because there's a there's a about the longest shot you can take there which if you're out west this wouldn't sound very far but for here the longest shot you could probably take there's about 350 maybe 400 yards which that's a really long way for anyone yeah. around there no, i don't shoot that far yeah there's well, typically typically the farthest shot you're gonna take around here is 200 yards the furthest shot i've ever took was down there and it was an eight point that I shot it. It was probably pushing 300 yards. Yeah, I and mean, that's that's a very, very far shot yeah. for anywhere around here. For at least West Virginia. Nice. So it's very important to make sure that you put that stain in a good location, whether it's in the middle of an oak an oak pasture where you've got a lot of acorns. Um, food and sources. Food sources is very important. Where and they're going to be at during guns. If you got people with you know gun pressure for rifle hunters, if you got a deer, deer you know got a lot of guys that come off of this one ridge and whatnot and then they're pushing deer to you that'd be a really good spot to put it yeah. out yeah and if there's not food there another thing that a lot of people do that that helps you a lot is some sort of a feed plot mm -hmm. um if, if you're not if you're not in an oak grove where there's going to be a lot of acorns every year you want to put some sort of food source there it's not really in my opinion by and there are people that do it but i don't see the financial benefit of keeping a feeder out year round that's yeah. you're going to spend so much money on corn see i'm I'm, I'm against the corn i do not, i i'm old school i rather hunt over trails where they're going you know bucks rub lines scrape lines 
oak patches. If there's a bunch of oak, that's where I'm going to be sitting up. The, the See, only thing I'm, that's I'm bad about a corn feeder is, is there's, 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 there's so many people, for us anyway, all around our farm, every single one of our neighbors uses corn. Yeah. So if, guess what? If you don't use corn, we ain't got no deer. Yeah. To me, I think it's cheating, but because I don't think it's the proper way of hunting. To me, I'd rather be, you know, the true hunter is going to go out in the woods actually trying to find. Well, it's a lot cheaper too. Yeah. You don't got to take the time to set up the feeder, buy the feeder, buy the corn, all that stuff. But this, well, this time of year, I like to use a feeder because the rut's not on yet. And if you want to get a buck early, you basically got to use corn to get them in. Well, you and you've got to have the, the main thing, honestly, is does. Yeah. And that's the one thing we are very, very hard around here about doe management. We always have at least a herd. When this is just as on our farm, but I don't know. I don't know if any time of year we don't try to keep at least 20 does here. Well, there's, there's always more than 20 does. You, there's, <clears> you'll see. And just what you see, you know you don't see all of them that are on your property at once, but we've counted 30 plus does in the field before. Yeah. Yeah, there's more does on our property and uh, also our neighbors. There's about, mostly dirt denied, they're going to be moving around and stuff. Yeah. And they're yeah. sit in the field. But there's at least, you know, 30 or so does, but no bucks. Yeah. And they're around, they're just not around where they're at. Yeah. So they're, it, they're it, away it, in the morning time to go and find them so and that's the reason like we're saying during early season like bow season we are not going to see as many bucks as somebody yeah. who feeds year round but guess what if you wait till the rest starts you're going to see, see bucks. we always we'll start out bow season like we have one one pretty nice eight point well, a couple four points and a spike on the property but i guarantee you come high rut or early you'll have mid, an eight point or, eight, eight, or ten point, point but I mean, and there was last year, it was it was one day before rice, rifle season, but there was a 12 point that walked right yeah. behind my house. Uh, and But that was that's the way the rut works. You see something one day and then you won't see it for the rest of the season. Yeah, so it's important to keep those on your property. Yeah, and make some, making sure you're getting out there knowing where the does are at in the mornings and the evenings and to catch the buck. Like, I, I would say for me, even though I haven't really hunted in a long time, but I kind of disagree on the part of where you were saying, like, not putting too much feed out, it's a financial thing. But if you do it a constant thing to where, like, you got deer showing up at your property every single day because there's food at one certain spot, then you have majority of it where bucks are gonna start showing up. And another thing, too, that I'm noticing is usually anywhere I see a buck, it's a small one. Yeah. And it's like already past like gun season. I'll be driving and next thing you know, there'll be just a four point. But majority of the time when you're doing a hunting season, hunters sometimes really don't care how big the buck is. They just shoot a buck that has antlers. And that's the thing that um, I kind of hate because I, I want to shoot a massive buck. And I haven't shot a buck yet. Well, I, I don't see the point of killing a buck it, if it's small. Because yeah. if you're hunting for meat, kill a doe. Yeah. There are so, so many does. Oh, yeah. I, I shoot, I'll shoot a doe anytime. I don't care. I, I shot a couple. But uh, for me, I want a trophy buck that, you know, I can look into. Yeah. And, 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 and Col I, in Colorado, it's, it, I don't know if it's just our side and their side. You know how, like, Ben said, I, I'd rather be a hardcore hunter and go find them. And that's what, down towards the west side, all of it is up mountains and terrain and stuff like that. That's what they do with elk and caribou and all of them. And I've seen outdoors, and I have a buddy that had to walk like 13 miles in order to find a buck, and he found like a 12-pointer. Yeah. But for us, it's a little bit different. We have hills, but we, we're stationary. Yeah. And they'll come to us whenever. But yeah. You just got to know the patterns. Yeah. You just know the patterns and then know the terrain mostly and see where their the food's coming from and then, you know, where they're mating and stuff like that. If you if you know, then you have a certain target spots um, in the area to find them. The, only, the three key or the several keys that I use is find your food source, find your bedding, and where they're traveling. Yeah. Uh, it's all really, it's all about where they are and where they're going. And really getting right in between that is like the perfect hot spot. Yeah. Well, in all, honestly, this is just my opinion, but the two things that make <clears throat> killing a real trophy buck in this state so hard, number one, and this is no secret, big big bucks get big because they're smart. Yeah. They're nocturnal. Yeah. And <clears throat> the other thing is, and I'm not going to say any names, it's just it's common knowledge that this happens, and it's bad <clears throat> around here where we live, but night hunters. Yeah. Poachers. There's a lot of poachers. A oh. lot of people kill big bucks at nighttime. Oh, don't tell me about poachers. I already arrested a couple, and 
and it's funny because like um i'll tell you the story there, there was a time where i was stationed at colorado and it's more of acres than just compact and all of it is just mount, uh, a little bit of hillside we're on a mountainside but the majority of it's hillside where gears elk anything from small critters to large critters they're always out there eating something and um i was patrolling and next thing you know i heard a gunshot and and it was at night so it was kind of weird and it sounded like it was on our um base like our, on our base so i i had to go out there with another buddy to go figure out and i see lights on the hillside which was on our uh, on our base so i had to go out there with mbgs so i had to go out there with m4 and stuff we were going chase uh trying to figure out where they're at once we got close enough we see tr like truck lights and i was like racking up uh, right around in my chamber and then we start crawling up to them and then all of a sudden there's uh, four guys and I almost got shot because i heard the bullet went past me and that's when i was like all right that's it we got close enough to pull our guns straight up to them and arrest four guys that were uh, what, 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 what were they out there poaching for elk yeah okay. mostly because uh there was actually a herd of elk when we we're trying to travel up there there was probably at least 30 or so elk out there yeah and, um, I mean, just just from pictures I've seen and, and, and rumors and stories I've heard around the county. And by the way, we're only into week number one of bow season. Yeah. This is bow season. We're not even in gun season. But I've got buddies who have already told me. I saw a picture yesterday of a 14 point that was killed over on the eastern side of the county. And it, everybody knows that the dude shot it with a 22 Hornet. And then he stuck an arrow in it. A 14 point. And it's not even gun season yet. Yeah. Where, then, where, did, where did he shoot it at? That's I don't know. I, I I'm not a hundred percent sure. I wonder if it was just shooting straight to the head and trying to figure. Well, out I mean, the, for, I, I mean, from the picture that I saw, the, you could tell that you could tell that it was. If I, you shot a deer with a twenty two horn in the head, yeah, it's very noticeable. Yeah, and it, it wasn't in the head. I'm pretty sure it was a broadside uh, even, shot. Even if it was a broadside shot. 22 horn it is so small so small plus you'd be tracking that thing for miles yeah and it, it'd be a slow death to me that is wrong yeah it's unless the wrong you, way to do unless it. you were a shot it got really lucky and decided to it went for a little so um shortage and then all of a sudden it just went down and they just found it and started stabbing it. I, I don't even know how people do that i would be so nervous that i got caught i don't yeah. even want to know the finest yeah. well, I, I, well, I, you, I, you wouldn't go to hunt no more neither you, you would lose your license and a bunch take your they'll take your gun yeah well it so I, I i was watching a video of actually a guy that was poaching on someone's land do you know a guy named flair on youtube yeah yeah so he he had it was like i don't know i think a year back i can't remember when he took uh, posted it but there was a guy poaching on their property because they heard a gunshot well he didn't hear it but his buddies on his property heard it and they drove down the road they see a truck they didn't see him, but they see the deer that was laying there. And next thing you know, he, the guy drove off. And, and it was like a 12-pointer, I do believe. It was a short buck. The one that he was looking for, it was big. But then the, the fine, the DNR that came there, I do believe what the guy said was three years um, suspension of his hunting and fishing license. And then possibly about ten to $12,000 fine. Plus, so, they could have took his gun. Yeah. yeah. Plus that was, I, I don't, th that was I don't know where he was at, but that's, I would say for here, yeah. It, he it is from, first. that's Andrew Fr Flair from Guggen, and he's from Nebraska. And that's a, their laws is different than our yeah. laws. I would but, say the fines are Like, our laws, same. I know they can, like, take your license, take Perm your guns, permanently. permanently take your license, take your guns, and then... A major twenty thirty thousand dollar fine. Yeah, I, I don't see how a deer's worth that. No, yeah, it's yeah, not. I would say it's not worth it to go on someone's property and then kind of ruin someone's. Well, else's well, and, and, and that's a whole other animal because in my it's, and I would never do it. I'm not trying to say I would, but I do feel like there is a difference between night hunting on your own land and someone else's. Yeah. I'm going to tell you right now though, and this I'm not just talking for myself. I'm talking for everyone in this room. If any of us ever heard a gunshot on our land at nighttime, you're just assuming somebody's trespassing. Yeah, I, I, you're going to be dead. We're going to kill you. Like, especially around West Virginia, you got a lot of people. Crackheads. Well, not just that. You got a lot of hillbillies around here, and the hillbillies, if you 
They'll trespass you, with no issues at all. Well, if you if you tick them off bad enough, they're going to come hunt you down. Yeah. You know? Now, now, luckily, I will say one thing. We've never, to our knowledge, we, me and me and my, my our papa, we've went out because we have thought we've had trespassers before. I've got my AR and he's got his shotgun, and we've went running through the woods looking for people. There was one time it was questionable. We did find guys, but. It Man, wasn't for sure. They were the right there on the property line. Yeah. It, what we couldn't tell if they'd been there, so we didn't do anything. Yeah. But for the most part, we are pretty fortunate. But it's not even just hunting. People are getting a lot more. I think it has a lot to do with drugs and in the, the state of the world right now. But people are getting a lot more brazen. Me and Aaron just had to go over to our buddy's house. What was it? Two days ago, because yeah. th they said that someone was squatting in his house. Yeah, but luck luckily there was nobody there. Yeah, but you know, yeah, you know, whenever. It's just the way that the world is not even just hunting. It's everything. I mean, yeah. I, I worry every day that someone's going to come out and break into the house. But Special, it, I feel bad for breaks into your house because they're dead. Yeah, and, and that's another thing that we're lucky about. There are some, our whole family populates this ridge. Yeah. So if, uh, and I'm just telling you, if you try to break in out here, then you're assigning your, yeah. you're, you're, you're going to die. Because if the person in that house don't get you, the person in the next house will. Yeah, so I mean, it's not... I'm not. We're very fortunate for the way that our land is. That we live on a dead end road, and then our whole family lives out here. So you're. It's not happening out here. But yeah. that's not the way it is for everyone. Ain't uh, just your family lives out here. Our both of our yeah. family lives out yeah, here. Yeah. So it's just not happening. And the and the and one thing that I love about this state, the reason I'll never go anywhere else, your neighbor is your neighbor. Yeah. Like your neighbors are there for you. They're they're there to help you and look out for you. So. It, and I know it's not like that everywhere. I know places where everybody, if if they don't know you on a on a first and last name basis, they could care less about you. But yeah. that's not the way it is around here. Everybody takes care of each other for the most part. Yeah, you've got some crackheads and some scumbags, but everyone cares for like, each other. They try to help each other out. Once winter comes around, just like an example, State Road don't get to our road until they've gotten every other road in the county because we live on a gravel road. So you've got to go help your neighbors clear out their driveways so they can get to and from work. You know, what I mean, you just yeah. The most majority of uh, people around don't have tractors or anything yeah. to plow for them. Yeah, and usually we'll so, help them somebody like, close has a tractor, and it's like if you need help, you call that person up. And it's like, hey, you come over here, give me a or, hand, or, or even if you know how to use it, you can just ask to borrow it, yeah. and then you know, pay for the pieces. Well, I mean, to yeah. me, that's debatable. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty it's particular with my equipment. Yeah, yeah. there's it, some it, people that just don't. Yeah, some people say, yeah, go ahead and just use it. But, you know, we have a tractor, and then also our grandpa has a tractor. Yeah. And, you know, we, we're fine using each other, but we're kind of really careful. But you still help them if they ask for help. Oh, well, yeah. You yeah. do help the neighbors out whatever, whatever they need. Yeah. But and that's what neighbors are for. Yeah. yeah. But besides the fact that we went on a kind of a frog leap to uh, talk about deers and stuff, I know we were kind of discussing a little bit about we'll the last, A little bit off but topic. I'll just put this out. If you see a poacher, call the game warden. Yeah. Call a game warden, share. Let them deal with it. Let them deal with it. Because, I mean, you know, here in West Virginia, you got, like I said, a lot of times we go manhunt and we want to go full, full bore half the time. Yeah, don't do what we said. If you want to do it the proper way, call the game warden. And they'll take care of it. And they that. will take care of it. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to go to one last commercial break. Right after we come back, we're going to talk a little about camouflage, the type of camouflage we use, and why we use it. Thanks. If you want professional results, you need a professional lure. Go with Windy Ridge Trapper. We've been making lures since 2005 that we use ourselves daily on the trap line. Whether it's Coon Juice, Beaver Buster, or Mad Dog, there's not a single one of them you can go, go wrong with. If you're interested, you can find them at our location where we buy fur in Rockport, West Virginia, or you can buy them online at murrayslures.com. Thanks. All right, welcome back from the commercial break. Aaron had to leave. We've got work in the morning, you know, because we're not rich. We're all broke white boys and have to make money. So Aaron had to go up to the house, get some stuff ready for work. We're going to continue to talk a little bit about camouflage, different kinds of camouflage we use, and why collars matter. Um, before we, we get started, one thing I'm going to mention, uh, there a while back I was watching a documentary, and I'm not going to make up some college, I can't remember, but I, I, I believe it was the, it was the USC, it, it was who did the study, but they did a study on deers and their vision and what collars that they can see, and from, from the wavelengths that they detected, 
the colors the deer can pick up the most are blue. Like apparently deer can pick up more, a wider range of the color blue than even our eyes can. So blue jeans are a no-go. Like deers can pick that thing up like a neon sign on the side of a wall. And so you know, even like during gut rifle season, I mean, you go, we all have to wear orange for our personal protection you know, out in the field. But for some reason, you think, well, deer's going to see you. For some reason, they can't. Yeah. And then sometimes it's funny because, like, if you've seen, like, movies and stuff, they'll wear jeans. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the deer's like, oh, there's nothing there, but there is something there, <laughs> you know? But it's like uh, another example, like, predator, you know, like, it has, like, infrared and stuff like that. It can catch, like, uh, blue and red because of thermal and stuff like that. I'm just like imagining that in my head. But yeah, I would say yeah, blue blue makes sense and it kind of if you start moving, they're gonna see it for sure. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's just funny how like because I remember when we go squirrel hunting. It's a, that's different. Yeah, like, it's when totally you go different. squirrel hunting, they're, they're not going to care less. Yeah, you you can wear blue and orange and then sit on a tree and wait for a squirrel to pop out. Yeah. But um, there was actually one time me and I think Ben or Dad, our Dad, uh, was squirrel hunting or deer hunting. Actually, we were actually deer hunting. Next thing you know, there was two does running like right next to us, and a coyote passed us. And, it, and uh, I'm just sitting there like, well, I mean, they didn't see us, but if there was no coyote there and there was deer right in front of us, they're going to see us. Yeah. And we're on a, we're sitting on the log. But. So so what kind of, whenever you go hunting, what kind of camo do you normally wear? Is there a certain brand that you like, a certain <laughs> pattern that you like? Well, I used to be a really hardcore real tree fan. That's all I usually wear. I've been starting to going into the... Uh, Mo mossy Mo oak. Well, the mossy oak bottomland. I like the design a lot better. I I mean, all the brands out there are really good. I still like real tree, but lately I've been going with the law or a bottomland design, the older uh, designs, because I, I think it looks a lot better up in, when you're looking up in a tree and you're seeing yourself kind of. I mean, Kind of, I mean, if you had somebody else, just imagine yourself up on a tree. To me, it just, it just depends on the type of the year. If you get, like right now here in West Virginia, we still got a lot of green leaves in the yeah. trees right now. Yeah. Real tree would be really good for that. Later in the season, like November, December, I get really heavy in that lost or bottom lane designs, but I still wear it in any ways. <laughs> So, so which company, and this is a very important part of hunting, I believe, because I don't get cold that easy, but whenever it's like, you know, below 20 degrees, especially whenever it's snowing or if you get even into the upper 30s or 40s and it starts raining, which which ones are more waterproof? Which ones keep you warmer? To be honest, I mean, unless you're wearing a, a waterproof suit of some sort, I mean... You're going to get wet. You're going to get, you're going to get wet. You're going to freeze to death. This last or last year when it was really, I think it was Christmas Eve I hunted, and I mean I had just a sweatshirt. I thought eh, it wasn't that bad. It's cold, but it wasn't you know super cold. And here come all that snow, and I I went from you know camouflage brown to snow white. <laughs> <laughs> Blood and getting more with the fire. But I was freezing cold, and I was like, well, deer's going to be moving eventually. And then uh, I ended up, it was getting dark, and I said, I'm going to the house. <laughs> so really, camouflage isn't, it, camouflage isn't a one-size-fits-all. You really need, whenever you're going to the store looking for camouflage, you need to be thinking about where you're sitting in the terrain that you're going to be in. A certain time of the year, if you're, if you like the early, you know, bow hunt, like right now, it's early season, the first week, second, or first or second week. This is, a, we're, we're coming in, today was the first day of the yeah, second that's week. that's right. I don't know. I got my days mixed up, but anyways, um, I don't like hunting early season, personally. Cause I well, it's hot. It's hot I, right it's now. It's warm. Plus, I don't got nowhere to put it. Cause I hang my deer. I hang them for at least three days, to, and then I process it myself. But when you, 
looking for like his extent or what he's asking. If you're going to go from early season, I started getting lightweight stuff. Anything lightweight. You know, you yeah, ain't you, gonna, you ain't going to sweat. Yeah, you don't want to be up there sweating your end off in the tree. You know, you ain't wearing like we're wearing. These sweatshirts are, I mean, they're pretty thick. And you ain't going to give up there and it's going to sweat and then the deer is going to smell you. Now, when it gets a little bit colder, you know, 40s and 30s, somewhere around that range, you start getting, you know, to me, I start wearing like this kind of stuff, just midway or midway warmth, you know, warm enough you ain't, you ain't gonna sweat. And then, you know, it gets really cold in the 20s or lower, you get really, really that. To me, I'm kind of cheap. I still wear my this regular sweatshirt, but I layer up. Yeah. You know, get long jongs, get extra double socks or woolly socks or. Uh, muck boots. I mean, I I hardly wear muck boots anymore because I hunt publicly and I got to walk. I rather have just regular boots, lightweight, some sort. So, so what's your opinion? I, I saw that you had some whenever you and Aaron went deer hunting yesterday. Whenever you was bow hunting, what's your opinion about that scent off spray or, or that scent off stuff? All oh, the scent, or the scent away stuff. Yeah. Uh, to me, I apply it. Especially like right now, I took all my clothes because I was at your house the other night and <laughs> had dog hair. I brushed it off, I sprayed it, and then I let it hang, let it air dry out so it, you know all the scent goes away, a little bit of the scent goes away because I don't want to smell like dog. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it helps a little bit. I mean, you can, if you really want to, you can just go out and just go hunt. To me, I'm very particular a little bit, keep them sent down a little bit. I mean, you might, you ain't gonna get all of it. I mean, yeah. I mean, like the night we went hunting, I mean, I came straight here to your all's place, ate a cheeseburger, and you know, had all that greasy, greasy food and, want, greasy food and whatnot. And plus, like I tried to, yeah. <laughs> I try to, you know, spray a little bit just to dilute it down a little bit so they don't pick you off too quick. So, I, so it's a lot like canine trapping. I mean, you're never going to completely eliminate scent, but anytime that you can, it's just a good idea to try to. Right. At least put a little bit extra effort to try to eliminate a little bit. I mean, I seen, I seen, uh, I, I showed Austin a uh, little TikTok of a short business, and it actually looks pretty cool. It's like, um, it's like that blender that mm -hmm. and it's a uh, spray off at the end of it. So like, I seen the guy use like what what was it we have here in West Virginia? The um, pop 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 pop. He used um uh, walnut hulls. Yeah, walnut hulls, and he just kind of put like two in there and started blending it, and then put a little bit of water in order to make it a scent, and he just sprayed it off uh, on him. I, I know a lot of people. I've seen that too. Um, if you're hunting in a pine thicket, a lot of people will bl blend up them pine needles and spray it on. Yeah, and, and that's a pretty cool idea. And also, it's, you know, saving you money. That's yeah. another thing, too, is uh, financial. If you're not going to go out there and spray a whole bottle, next, you know, the next day you're going to have to spend, like, what? I now it's, like, 16 to $20 uh, for a bottle. It's about 10 to 12 bucks if you get it at Walmart. But, but that's I, a, get it, I get it in gallons. But that's the thing, though. You can yeah. make your own scent. And I, me, I don't care about money, but I also like to have something cheap. Yeah. And and for something that, like, you can also you just make it yourself. You don't have to have what the guy made. You can just throw a, a old blender and start throwing water and, you know, like, pee, uh, pine needles and stuff like that. Just yeah, just, 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 just something to cover up the smell of yeah. you. Yeah. This, yeah. This, that's the whole basic idea when I apply the scent away is just diluting it down a little bit. I mean, I, I hope my whole idea is I spray it down and I climb in, get you know in a good position where I'm gonna shoot. I'm hitting around. When I'm up, I look for something with a background so they can't pick, the whole idea is they can't, I don't want them picking me off. Yeah. I don't want them to, you know, look right at me and say, oh, there's a human up in that tree. I want them, you know, really look if they're notice something's wrong and hopefully I can kill it when, before that happens. But if not, I don't want them, you know, looking right at me. I want them, you know, really look hard, kind of like canine trapping. Yeah. Because, I mean, I don't want them smelling me and I don't want them visually seeing me. Yeah. Because I like to have a lot of cover 
so they can't pick me off and i just like make sure my wind i always i take milkweed i was telling you he's like what is this little ball looking thing i because i picked some the other day because i was out and just a little it's a uh, milkweed it's a it's a pod with all those hairs in it with little hairs in it and that's i throw and it's an old kind of old school way and i like it a lot better than chalk or chalk uh powder like you get at walmart you get that dead down wind stuff I still use it a little bit, like I'm up in a tree and I want to just puff it a little bit, see which way the wind going. But a lot of times I'm up in a tree or even without the um, chalk, I'll take that, just a little piece of milkweed and I'll flick it up in the air and then you can see how, which way the wind is going, especially with all your scent and everything. And I don't want to, you know, if I got a deer like where Jeremiah is at, and I'm on a tree right here, I want my wind blowing the opposite direction. Yeah, and I mean that's really important around here because up here on these ridge lines of West Virginia, <laughs> it's that so, that wind swirls; it, it changes directions it, constantly. Especially if you're up in a, a top of ridge or even down the, the bottoms of the hills. I mean that wind can go whatever direction. A lot of times I just keep checking it every once in a while I, I pull a little piece and i'll flick it up to see which what make sure i'm still good if i'm still good i'm gonna continue hunting and one of the uh, another things too i know we talked about tree stands and then like different colors and stuff but you know how like what we said before is like with people with medical issues that or any fears of height they can't get into a tree stand you know blending of the color matters in the background like yeah. you said so one of the key things that the military taught taught us the same way but in order to make sure you blend in with the environment, you have to use the environment around you. So <clears throat> snipers, of course, is a key example. They they have camo, like they have the OCP or depending on what uniform they're using in the environment. Mm -hmm. So there's desert colored uh, from desert OCPs back then. And then you got the multi cam colors that we had for the Army and the Air Force and then digital colors that the Marines use. But that's just mostly in the uh areas we live in yeah but with the background so let's say for example if i was using with during the springtime when the colors come in i want to make sure i use every color so if i'm picturing let's say for example i got oak woods in front of me with dead gra uh, dead, dead leaves which is right now fall i want to use at least some of that um, leaves to put onto me. Yeah, you're trying and, to make you're yeah, you make a to homemade be the yeah, the environment. So pe the snipers use uh, the homemade stuff. They they take not like little strings and stuff. They knot those uh, branches and everything together. So like in the wheat fields and stuff like that. You, you if you play like Call of Duty for example, you'll see like they blend in with the environment. Yeah. Um. So that's one one of the key things. If you're if you don't hunt and you want to hunt and you're if you're cheap. I would use the environment around you. I, I do that full, uh, too. Um, when I went squirrel hunting, I use stuff around me and put it on me. Yeah. So it, it helps with the environment and also blend in. And also it helps with scent too. Yeah. Because majority of it, if you rub, for example, rub dirt for your hands and your face and stuff, it uh, blends in with the environment and also helps with the scent yeah. uh, from covering it. Yeah, it traps all up against your skin. Yeah. Right? So that's why um, another thing too is that you know some people don't rub the face mask and everything on their face but it actually helps with that too and i yeah. do believe um when when we watch the footage with ben and aaron going hunting i just feel like uh the dre uh the deer was kind of looking at him because yeah. he's he, his face was not covered yeah and uh, also he was up in a tree and also at, at an angle so where the trees at first gonna sample he was over here from what the footage is and the deer was right here so he saw him from like from the side of the tree yeah like if if he if was he pointed been, towards yeah. him he would blend in and the deer wouldn't see him yeah so that that would help with that what was it the four point mm -hmm. it was a little four point but yeah i mean he wouldn't have shot it yeah he way. wouldn't have shot it i would say you know i'm not gonna shoot that i want a bigger buck but you yeah. know um what like they start mating during the summer is that what you usually no, do? no 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 my so 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 bucks make during the rut which is which around here is about the first to second week of november we're still about a i'm not quite a month but we're about a month about normally about thanksgiving week yeah it's about during rifle season it, it's kind of weird because usually it's different in the west because uh they kind of mate somewhere close to the springtime i don't know if it's just the weather or what but i'm not science um but 
the antlers started growing during around this time. Like they're massive over there. And I don't know if what they're feeding over there or what uh, what they do and stuff like that. It's way different down here, of course. I don't know. <laughs> like I said, I'm not a science guy. Well, well one thing <laughs> that I want to touch on real quick before we leave, and this is a major safety aspect, and, and Ben talked about this earlier, but no matter how healthy you think you are, if you're going to be up in a tree, you need to be safe. You need to be a, find a way to be secured. Ben Ben's a relatively healthy dude, and if he wouldn't have had that harness on the day he fell out of that tree, whenever he passed out, he'd probably be dead. It probably would have killed him. You need to get a harness. If you're going to be not even 10 foot off the ground, you need to wear a harness. I don't care how high you're going to go. I mean, I've seen guys go 50 foot up. I mean, I think that's a little crazy, but... About 20 to 30 foot is about my max with my tether. And I would say try it somewhere. Like for example, if you're gonna use, like you're, you're using, I would start from five feet. So where you're not away from the ground from like 30 feet up in the air, just to test it. Well, I would test it where you're on the ground at least, but you're using it all your uh, weight on it. I, I mean, I mean it, you're safe. definitely right. I think it's good to be familiar with whatever product that you're using. Right. That's. Whenever I had gotten this tethered, I thought, man, I thought this is kind of stupid and thinking, well, it's not I, don't, I don't see how this is safe. And then I got it and tried it. And then I see the point, you know, you're always, you're always, you're attached. always safe. You're always attached and always the safe. The one that, uh, one thing, um, and I'll stop talking is that uh, anything you see See if anybody else has it. Yeah. It gives you, a good it gives idea you an it idea. And also you can ask them, like, hey, can I try this for a second and, like, see if I like it or not? Then you can get the same thing and also use it. Yeah. Because I would hate to go. It's like saying, like, I like this car. And you go out and try their car. If you don't like it, then you're not going to get that yeah. car. Yeah. It's like same thing with anything from equipment-wise when it comes down to hunting. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's very, very important to stay safe because if you die, you can't hunt anymore. So <laughs> there's a lot of people are paralyzed. Yeah. You know, falling, I mean, a lot of old timers, like, you know, they just go climb a tree and, you know, hunt. And then if they fall out, they, they're flat on their ground. Flat yeah. on their back. And, and the thing is, if people don't know where you're, if people don't know exactly where your stand was, people might never find you. Exactly. You might, and, and that would be even worse than falling and dying. You're going to fall and you're going to lay there for Lord knows how long, a couple days, and you're either going to die from the elements or hopefully someone will find you. But you, do you want to lay somewhere paralyzed for three days? Especially, I mean, even since I'm now public land hunting now, you know, if Jeremiah's at the house, you know, and I, I'm hurt or whatnot, I'm gonna drop a pin on my phone and send it to him so they know exactly where I'm at because yeah. they have no clue where I'm at. Yeah, we have the technology now to where you can be as safe as possible. Another example of that is whenever we go beaver trapping on the Ohio River, you you do not do that by yourself. No. That is a good way to kill yourself. Especially the way that river is. If you fall out of that boat and you're far from the boat ramp, you're gonna to freeze to death. Freeze uh, or you even sucked into yeah, it. Yeah, you, you, you'll drown. You, you drown, freeze to death. There's a, there are so many different things, and it's not just hunting, it's fishing, it's trapping. It's, it's always is a good idea, when, especially whenever the elements are rough. It's winter time. I know that there are states, especially way north of us, up um, upper in Maine and then Montana, Alaska, states like that, where it's substantially worse than what it is here. But even here in West Virginia, we have nights where it gets below zero. And uh, a prime example of that there was a week last year whenever me and ben went out we started out the day trapping and and it was november so it wasn't plum freezing yet but i, I think it was what 40 degrees in the morning whenever we started well we got down the river and it was 28 degrees and it started raining and that is a good way if you are by yourself nothing bad happened to us then but if you're by yourself and you're on a boat and you're 15 miles from the boat ramp and you start to freeze to death and you pass out from hypothermia then you're dead it doesn't matter what you're doing. Anytime that you put yourself into a situation and you're not going to be bow hunting with someone, but but drop a pin. Let, let someone know where you're going. Make sure you've got a harness. Make sure if you're in a boat, you've got life jackets. You've got the proper the, the proper safety gear. And Look at your rigs. Yeah. Look at your rigs. All, every year is different. 
I always read them, make sure you know everything's. This, if it, even if it's changed, I want to make sure that I'm legal. I know what the proceed procedure is. And just be safe. Yeah. So the things that and you gotta, enjoy it. Yeah. So, yeah. so the things that you gotta look into, like you said, pen your location. It don't have to be your wife or your mom or your dad. It could be a friend. Just somebody you need to know who has your location. If something happens, let them know how long you're gonna be out there. Because if you were going out there for like say five hours and you're gone for like eight, there's something wrong. Yeah. And also, you know, check equipment, check your environment, and all that kind of stuff. And also check your, like I said, check your equipment, like your harness or your deer stand or something. If something happens, there's no sense in doing that night. Yeah. Uh, you have literally the whole season. You don't have to do it like all oh, my hunting. Is That's like with my deer. tether system. I had to go buy new ropes. My ropes from last year was, uh, it was starting to, starting to go bad because I've had it for two years now. So, and they recommend every year to replace them. So I thought I'm gonna stretch it a little bit longer. Well, this year they're starting to go bad, so I went ahead and just bought new ones. So I, that rope doesn't snap and I yeah. fall backwards. It's very important to maintain your safety gear. Mm -hmm. Well, we really appreciate everyone joining us today on this ver on this episode of the Windy Ridge Outdoor Podcast. If you have any questions or comments or in just any any general anything general that you want to leave down in the comment section just leave us a comment if there's anything in the future you want to see you can leave that down there too leave us a like and share your friends and we'll catch you on the next one thanks